uh, Trooper Buchnick or Trooper Prockner how he extracted the tests, uh, despite the fact that it was done by a friend of his in the federal government. Um, during the federal proffer, Brian Higgins admits that he had been served with the preservation order and the Commonwealth told him he could destroy his phone despite the order. He then drives to a military base on Cape Cod, opens his phone, breaks the SIM card, and throws the phone away. And he says that he discussed destroying his phone with Brian Albert. Brian Albert also destroyed his phone. And Brian Albert uh, said that he had uh, received some text that concerns him as an explanation. And after that, Brian Higgins changes his phone number and changes his cell carrier. In short, he was present that night, he had a motive, and there is plenty of consciousness of guilt cover-up evidence with regard to Mr. Higgins. Moving on to Colin Albert. Shortly before January 29th of 2022, Colin Albert lived with his parents, Christopher Albert and Julie Albert, on John O'Keefe's street, just two doors down. We have evidence of bad blood between Colin Albert and John O'Keefe. We have evidence. How old, how old was Colin Albert at that time? I believe he was 16 at that time. Okay. We have evidence that Colin Albert and John O'Keefe used to get in confrontations because Colin Albert used to cut through his yard without permission and John O'Keefe was not happy about that. We have evidence that Colin Albert used to throw beer cans intentionally into John O'Keefe's bushes and John O'Keefe was not happy, happy about that. We have evidence that Christopher and Julie Albert knew of this conflict. We have evidence that they referred to John O'Keefe uh, as Nebercracker. That's a character from, a, I think, a kid's movie uh, who was known as the get off my lawn guy. When John O'Keefe and Karen Reed were vacationing in Aruba over New Year's Eve 2022, the Alberts, Christopher and Julie, taunted him. They went to his porch and they had photos taken of themselves drinking on John's property when he wasn't there to do anything about it, evidencing they knew how upset he was at what Colin Albert had been doing. Now, the investigators in this case, Your Honor, including Michael Proctor, kept Colin Albert's name completely out of the police report. When this case began, I had no idea who Colin Albert was. Um, I received a tip right from the jump that Brian Albert and his nephew had beaten up John O'Keefe. I didn't even know Brian o Albert had a nephew at that time. But after receiving the tip, I learned of the conflict that Colin Albert had with John O'Keefe, so I sent a letter to Mr. Lally, I believe by certified mail. I knew that the DA's office was planning to present evidence or witnesses to a grand jury, and at that early juncture, before anybody uh, had, been, had asked them to indict, um, I notified the DA of three potential suspects, the ones that I'm talking about now, Brian Higgins, Brian Albert, and Colin Albert. Um, after he received that letter at our next court appearance, I'm sure Mr. Lally can confirm this, um, he acknowledged that both Brian Albert and Brian Higgins would be testifying or had testified before the grand jury, but he questioned why I included Colin Albert in my letter. He told me at the time that he had no evidence that Colin Albert was there that night. However, after receiving my letter, lo and behold, multiple witnesses testified that Colin Albert was at 34 Fairview the night of January 28th to 29th. And now the DA will argue, I'm sure, at trial that he left before Joan O'Keefe arrived. We don't find their evidence compelling. We don't accept it. We are not required to accept their theory of the case. We're entitled to present a defense. His presence at 34 Fairview gave him the opportunity, along with the motive, to harm John O'Keefe. With regard to Brian Albert, Your Honor, um, this is a well-connected, well-known, powerful family in the town of Canton, Massachusetts. Brian Albert was present at that home when Colin Albert was there. <coughs> Colin Albert is a member of the Albert family. He's nephew of Brian Albert. We have evidence that Brian Albert had expressed hostility toward John O'Keefe as well. And we know that he initiated a phone call with Brian Higgins at 2.22 in the morning. He reached out to Brian Higgins. 
And then he picked up the phone when Brian Higgins came back and they spoke for 22 seconds. And they never revealed any of that to investigators. Again, consciousness of guilt and perhaps most of all, Brian Albert is a first responder. He is duty bound to help somebody who's in trouble. He was notified that John O'Keefe was in trouble. Brian Albert stayed in his home. He knew what was going on outside. His sister-in-law was out there, civilians, medical personnel eventually arrived. He did nothing. That is also consciousness of guilt. Now, Your Honor, with regard to all of that third-party culprit evidence to admit it substantively, which I would assert to the court is, is both overwhelming and powerful, with regard to the Bowdoin uh, argument here, the police investigated none of that. That didn't come from the Commonwealth. They had a, a complete lack of curiosity as to what was going on in that house that night. They didn't care. Investigators never went in. The feds investigated, and that's where we got a majority of this evidence. So, you know, to, to the extent that the Commonwealth now claims that they didn't have notice of this, um, I, I beg to defer. They, they got notice of this when we got notice of this. Uh, you know, the Finney case, Your Honor, again, I'm, I'm well familiar with it. It stood for the proposition that, you know, if, if you want to point the finger at a third party culprit, you've got a constitutional right to do that. And if you want to point out inadequacies in a police investigation, you have a constitutional right to do that. Right? It's for those reasons that I ask you to deny the Commonwealth's motions. Okay, thank you. Any response, Mr. Lally? Uh, briefly, Your Honor. Um, just first, uh, again, what, what the case law requires is evidence and not just mere speculation or saying that you have evidence is not actually evidence. Um, I, I do find it somewhat interesting that Mr. Yannetti uh, wrote apparently four and a half pages of notes but didn't have time to write a motion uh, to admit uh, the evidence uh, that he claims that he has. Um, he references in regard to uh, third party culprit uh, Dr. Sheridan. Uh, who indicated that the injuries are consistent with the fight. He's the same doctor who indicated that the injuries on uh, Mr. O'Keefe's arm were consistent with the dog bite, which was then refuted by the DNA findings from UC Davis, as well as the fact that the injuries are only on one side of the arm. And last time I checked, uh, dogs have teeth uh, on the top and the bottom, and there's no injuries to the bottom of Mr. O'Keefe's arm. Uh, furthermore, <coughs> the council references the federal grand jury materials in which uh, I would say, uh, as has been done numerous times previously, is, is severely mischaracterized as to what they actually contain. Uh, so what, uh, the, and it's not a crash reconstructionist as it's been alleged here before, it's a biomechanical engineer. Uh, and essentially what they did was take painstaking lengths uh, to go to, uh, to determine that uh, the defendant's vehicle did not strike uh, Mr. O'Keefe in the back of the head, which is simply something that no one has ever said, intimated at any point ever. Um, <clears throat> there is also a medical examiner uh, in the federal materials who concurs uh, completely with Dr. Scordibello's uh, findings as it pertains uh, to the cause and manner of death. So with regard to each of these, the other thing that I would point out is, is counsel was uh, counsel record with the Finney case. The Finney case relates to third party culprit under the Bowdoin event. So it's not applicable to what counsel uh, was arguing. Um, it is a low standard, but it's also one that the defendant here has not met. It's not one without limits. Uh, as it pertains to much of, of the material uh, that it was uh, summarized uh, as far as uh, speculation as to what different things uh, counsel feels mean uh, from, from various uh, things regarding Mr. Higgins, uh, Colin Albert, and Brian Albert, just starting with Colin Albert because that's frankly the easiest. 
He wasn't at the house, and that's what the federal materials confirm with each of every single of the witnesses that were spoken to by uh, the district attorney's office or the troopers or testified to the state grand jury. They testified to the exact same things in the federal grand jury, that Colin Albert had left the house prior to uh, the defendant and the victim arriving there, and there's absolutely nothing uh, to combat that whatsoever uh, other than, again, just rank speculation. So opportunity would be a little bit amiss uh, if he's not even there at the same time uh, as Mr. O'Keefe, regardless of, of the invalidity of any sort of uh, you know, ill feelings or ongoing feud uh, that's purported uh, from whatever unknown evidence uh, counsel claims to have. In regard to Mr. Higgins, uh, that, that, that was a fanciful story, but again, there's actually no actual evidence of, of most of those things, uh, or at least the, the imputations or the connotations uh, the council wants to put uh, behind uh, that. Um, whatever he feels, uh, things were observed. Um, so again, I'm not sure where the evidence uh, from this is coming from. Uh, what I'm also a little confused in regard to is that if Council is merely relying on materials within the federal grand jury um, and just learned of them at that same time as, as we learned of them when uh, materials were provided pursuant to TUI, uh, then it's a little peculiar that the exact same arguments uh, were being made throughout the pendency of the case well, well, well before uh, council was provided with any of those uh, federal materials. Um, what council just went through is essentially a list of rank speculation and not actual evidence. Um, as far as the mysterious uh, portion that's missing uh, from the, the Sally Port, there's a number of different, it's, it's a motion activated camera for the most part. The other thing that I would uh, direct the court's attention to as it was contained within the st state grand jury proceedings uh, is there is cruiser camera video from the Canton Police Cruisers. Specifically, there is cruiser camera video from Cruiser 682. Specifically, there is cruiser camera video from Cruiser 682 at 822 in the morning uh, when a lieutenant and sergeant from the Canton Police on their own go over to One Meadows Ave, which is the, the residence of Mr. O'Keefe, to do a well-being check because they had not received any information as to how the children were or if they were there being attended to. And they pull into the driveway at 8.22 in the morning, directly behind the defendant's vehicle, which is exactly where Ms. McKay parked it when they stopped there to see if Mr. O'Keefe was there before then piling into Ms. Roberts' vehicle and proceeding to 34 Fairview. And what you can see within that cruiser camera video at 8.22 in the morning is the damage to the right rear taillight of the defendant's vehicle. Well before, the defendant had then come back to the house after the hospital and then gotten in three separate cars with her family and driven in a blizzard all the way back to her parents' house in Dighton. And then the vehicle had then been towed from Dighton back to the Canton Police Station uh, by the state police with the assistance of the Dighton Police. Do you know what exhibit number that is before the grand jury? I believe it's 56, but I, I, I may be, I, I can certainly locate that information. And again, as far as Brian Albert is concerned, I, I heard nothing other than he's apparently in a well-connected family in Canton and Colin is his nephew who wasn't present at the house when Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed were present at the house. So again, I think it's a stronger argument, certainly if, if we're trying to bootstrap onto a Bowdoin defense uh, and counsel will probably likely be allowed to uh, at least investigate that as far as impeachment, cross-examination, things of that nature, but there is absolutely nothing beyond just a, a fertile imagination and rank speculation as it applies to a third-party culprit defense. And for that reason, uh, the Commonwealth's motion to exclude it should be allowed. Hi. The only thing I'd like to correct, Your Honor, is, well, or at least point out, is that, um, you know, the car pinged at 5.30. So hold, hold on until you get to the microphone. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the car pinged at 5.36 p.m., indicating that it was in the Sally Port. Um, there is an outdoor camera where you can see the car about to enter the, uh, the Sally Port at 5.31. Of course, you can't see the taillight in that outdoor, um, you know, camera. But Mr. Lally just argued before you, well, the reason why there's no, uh, you know, video of the car uh, between 5.08 and 5.50 is that it's motion activated. And I just ask the court, 
to use common sense here that if the car's entering, and by the way, the car's there at 550 with a couple of people around it. When the, the camera comes back on, you see the car. So unless it was teleported in a split second so that the, the, the interior camera would not pick up motion, it drove into the sally port. I believe that's the definition of motion and it should have been picked up according to Mr. Lally's own words. Okay, so when you walk away from the microphone, it's harder for the court reporter to hear you, Mr. Unetti. And I apologize, Judge. It, it's, um, you know, according to Mr. Lally's own words, it should have picked up the movement. Okay. All right, so I believe that's the last motion. So why don't we recess until two o'clock? And I'll see you back here at two. Mr. Lally, will you have uh, Ms. Gilman, who I did see walk in here at one point, set up the screen oh, right where we normally keep it? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. You are muted. Last time you were reading. Thank you. 